Christian Parenting. Welcome to the Christian Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Steph Thurling. I'm the Executive Director of Christian Parenting, a mom of three, and I am so glad that you're here. This is a place where you can bring your real self, no matter what that looks like today, and be given the space, resources, and encouragement you need to set aside perfection and grow into the perfectly imperfect parent God made you to be. You guys, I am thrilled to tell you about a new movie that I just saw that is coming out on October 4th called White Bird. From the world of wonder, which sparked a movement to choose kind, comes the inspirational next chapter, White Bird. Struggling to fit in at his new school after being expelled for his treatment of Augie Pullman, Julian is visited by his grandmother, who's played by Helen Mirren, and is transformed by the compassionate and heroic story of her attempts to escape Nazi-occupied France during World War II. This movie is about World War II and is PG-13, so there's some heavy content scenes, so use your discretion when it comes to bringing your own younger kids. Maybe even consider a date night. Whitebird is from the director of Finding Neverland and reminds us to be brave and choose kind. It's exclusively in theaters beginning October 4th, so go enjoy it. Hey everyone, so today is a repeat guest on the Christian Parenting Podcast, and I could not be more excited about it. I was sitting down with Ruth Cho Simons, and we are talking about her new children's book, Home is Right Where You Are. We cover so many things in this conversation, and there is so much wisdom throughout. Ruth is candid about the evolving journey of parenting, emphasizing the importance of recognizing different seasons in family life. She shares insights on how to cultivate a home centered on God's presence, the significance of discipleship, and practical tips for raising boys to love Jesus, which I think could be applied to girls too, so don't miss out on those. Ruth reflects on the challenges of maintaining presence in parenting, and she even gives me some really practical and convicting advice on how we make our promises to our kids. And we also cover the process of launching children into adulthood and the value of sibling relationships. Ultimately, Ruth highlights the transformative nature of motherhood and the grace of Jesus in the parenting journey. I know that you're going to love this conversation, so enjoy it. Hi, Ruth. Welcome back to the Christian Parenting Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So you were here almost exactly a year ago talking about how God's character changes our parenting. So I'm really excited to have you back because I loved that episode and all the wisdom that you shared Mm. with us. So thank you for joining us. Yeah. It's so good to be here. Yeah. Let's do a little catch up. What have you and your family been doing over the course of the last year? Just (laughs) So much. (laughs) I know. I'm like, wow. Um, Well, as of right this minute, I only have three of my six boys at home. We've got one at grad school um, in Wisconsin. We have one um, who's a junior at his college, and my newest um, college student is a freshman at that same school in Arizona. And so that's that's the biggest change since last fall. Um, I, I released a a different message, a different book it, back in spring called Now and Not Yet. That really mm-hmm. is kind of like, I would say that's even a very parenting centric message in that there are different seasons, right? There are different seasons mm-hmm. of our lives, seasons where we feel hidden, seasons where we're, um, we kind of feel like we're stuck in the mundane. And so it's so many of my books are different angles of similar topics, but approaching it from different perspectives. And so last time we talked so much about God's character because we have to start there. We really have to start with who God is if we're going to shape anybody in our lives, including our children. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, I've been on a journey personally of just really, really recognizing that, um, that God is at work in my current season, even if, even as we speak, I'm not where I want to be. And I don't have all the circumstances that I feel like I need to succeed at what He's given me to do. I'm going, Lord, help me feel a little bit more equipped here. And I think as parents, we often feel that way. And so um, there's so much there for us to just be faithful one step at a time, one day at a time. And thanks for asking me the question, because personally, I'm always like, you know what, I'm going first. You know, Even if I'm writing this book or whatever message I'm sharing at the time, I'm learning it in real time. And so Mm -hmm. between last time we talked and now, I think I'm currently just really pressing into, okay, I don't know what's coming, and I'm not sure how to 
really be the mom for this new season I'm in, but I'm taking it one day at a time, learning as I go and trying to apply the very things that I share about in my own life day by day. Yeah. Well, I love that you said that because I think that candidly, people probably look at you and are like, well, she has it all together and knows exactly her direction and where she's going and what's going on. And I just like that you're sharing that it's still a process for everyone. Yeah. And then day by day, we have to rely on the Lord to Absolutely. do everything from work to parenting. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's all hard. Yeah. Okay. So how old are your boys now? You have My oldest is... Yes, my oldest is 22, and he's in okay. graduate school, and um, and my youngest is 11, and he's in seventh grade. Yeah, I have a seventh grade boy, too. It's, it's quite the season, isn't it? Um, it sure is. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing some little, like... Um, parenting kind of little forms with the launch team for this new children's book. And we've been talking about different seasons in parenting. And last night we talked a little bit about um, the teen years. And I just got to say, it's it, it's turned out to be some of my favorite years with my kids, but they're not without its challenges. And right around 12, 13 is when you're like, Okay, this is a little bit of a roller coaster, but we're going to make it. And yeah. um, and how you how you steward those years can really affect whether it becomes a burden or if it just becomes the biggest blessing. And we're learning as we go that, gosh, the teen years can be the best years. Yeah, you are not the first person to say that on this podcast. I've had a lot of people say that, and I feel like it I'm just glad. us with younger kids so yes. much hope because you hear teens and you're yes. like. Ooh. <laughs> right. And everybody's kind of like, oh my goodness. Or when we get to the teen years, they're not going to want to hang out with us at all. And we're going to be obsolete in their lives. And that's not true. That's not true. Yeah. So I I try to wave that flag of like, it can be amazing. And your kids can be in really special relationship with you, even in their teens. Yeah. Okay. I love that you wrote a children's book for your boys, especially since your youngest is in seventh grade. And yeah. what is it like? So it's based on what you want them to know and wisdom from Psalm 23. So what is about this phase of parenting and Psalm 23 in particular that inspired you to write this book now? Yeah. You know, I kind of didn't want them to all be like out of the house and grown adults before I come up with my first picture book, like children's picture book, because I'm an illustrator as well. I'm an artist and author. I've never done something like a children's book. But um, so I thought, you know, I'd really love for them to be still in my home when I have this come out. Mm -hmm. But I think it's that I am in this with, with six kids, 11 years apart. I'm walking through various seasons and various transitions all at the same time. Everything from a young one trying to understand how to like trying to kind of be a big boy and like really come into his own and be responsible to my 22 year old paying for his own rent and dealing with his own responsibilities, thinking about his future. Um, there's a, there's a holding tight and letting go all at the same time. And my mm -hmm. life is filled with, this is how you do your laundry and put away the dishes to this is how as a mama, I listen and I don't speak into everything because you're an adult that needs to figure some of those things yourself. And and as I walk through those transitions and changes in home and realize that my boys are also reassessing like, okay, what does it mean to be on my own? What does it mean to kind of come into understanding who I am, who I'm made to be by God? Psalm 23 kind of becomes that common denominator, the reminder that for everyone in any season, for the mom and the child or the grown child, or the empty nester, we all need to remember that wherever we go and whatever we do, God is with us. And that we read in Psalm 23 that He's the good shepherd. He is our shepherd. And I wanted to capture the essence of that, the essence of God goes with you. There's not one thing that you mama or you child will go through that can't be completely secure and at rest because you walk with God. And if you do, you need to recognize that He's your true home. So your location can change. The way your home looks could change. You could be an empty nester and all your children no longer make a lot of noise in your house. But whatever change comes, if your home is truly with Jesus, then you'll never really be far from home. And that concept that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever at the end of Psalm 23 is kind of the whole, um, 
foundation to this idea of home. Home is right where you are. Yeah. I love that theme that God is with you wherever you are. Because I think when you're not with your parent, what's so important as parents, especially moms, I think it's so easy to fall into that trap of being like the most important, you know, mm-hmm. the one who can fix it all and heal it right. all. And obviously we can't, but our human flesh desires that so badly. Mm-hmm. We want to elevate ourselves um, because we love our kids so much and we want to be everything we can be for them. Right. So let's talk about that for a minute. Like, let's dive into why it's important for us to point to Jesus as their true foundation and as their home. And how did you continually do that with your boys? Yeah, you know, I think we can either share the gospel and share the hope we have in Christ as kind of something that just betters our kids' lives, or we can share it as, hey, this is what you were meant to fully live into and live for. And if we believe the latter is true, then we spend our days discipling our children by not just saying, hey, following Jesus is like gaining a skill or, you know, checking something off the box and making sure that you have this in your life, but rather following Jesus is the only way to experience true life. And so if that is true, then this idea of home, the very thing that causes them to feel safe and secure, the shelter that they come home to every day after being with their friends or not friends, and when they're tired from being at sports practice or all day at school or just being out in the world, when they come home, their safety in their bedroom or in their home or at the kitchen table or with their siblings or with their mom and dad. But that sense of home isn't dependent ultimately on even us, the most important people in their lives, if they find their home with Christ. And so the way we cultivate that is ultimately to say, this is just a taste. Like our mm. our relationship, the good food we eat, the the way we experience like closeness, the way in which your mom and dad will never betray you and we won't fail you. We promise we'll be here. That's just a taste. It's just a little bit of a reflection of the goodness of God and what God wants to show you as your Heavenly Father. And so as we share those things, ultimately home isn't just a feeling. It's a it's a secure and eternal, unshakable place of belonging with Christ Himself. Yeah. We always tell our kids, there's nothing you can ever say or do that will ever make me love you less. Mm -hmm. But I'm a human and I can't do it perfectly, but God can. And God love loves that. you even more than we do. I love that. Yeah, it's a good reminder because we do. We want to love them so perfectly, but we're human, so we can't. <laughs> I know that there's no secret sauce to raising kids, but you do have six. Do you have like a few top tips that you have for raising boys to love Jesus? You know, my most <laughs> tippity top thing that I've learned over the years is that more is caught than taught. As in, I can sit down and be like, it really is wise for you to read the Bible from beginning to end, and it's really wise for you to do these things, or don't say this, do say that. And we can teach a lot of things, but more is caught than taught because our boys and the children in your home, they're watching and they don't even realize they're watching. You don't even realize how much they're absorbing. And the way in which they respond to disappointment is so often a reflection of what they experience as the response to disappointment in the home. Or whether we normalize repentance and seeking forgiveness, right? If you grow up in a home where your parents never model for you what it looks like to say, I'm sorry, that was really icky of me to say it that way. Let's try that again. Please forgive me for saying that. If you don't hear that ever modeled, chances are you're going to have a really hard time saying those words yourself. And so, so much of what we see in discipleship really is about a master and apprentice, somebody who really says, I've been practicing this for a long time. Let me go first. Let me show you how I'm living this out. And you get to practice by following me. And so we're little Christ followers, we're Christ followers, and they're followers of their parents who are following Jesus. And that's how we disciple and we lead them. And so I'd say my number one thing, my number one, if call it a tip or just um, paradigm, is that if Troy and I cannot go first and live it out, 
we won't be able to expect our boys to understand the significance of those things that we want them to learn. Um, and then the second thing I think maybe these are my top two is just that, um, that we go through a lot of seasons where there are things that are hard and pressing and sometimes job and work and finances, lots of things can be pressing, but And it doesn't mean that your kids will be ruined if you're working late or you have to travel a lot, but it does mean that you have to, you do have to make choices about presence Um, Mm -hmm. and that presence affects our kids more than so much. I mean, I think about how um, we could be home all day long, but if our phone is in our hands the entire time, we won't really be present. Um, Kids know when you're not giving them your full attention. They know when they're telling you a story and you're just nodding. And so much of parenting happens in the cracks of life and in the moments where you're just doing dishes and you didn't sit down to go have a major conversation. We as parents tend to think that parenting happens when you have a a discipline or a discipleship moment or when you have a real important conversation about relationships or when um, this is, they're turning 13 and you're going to really help them see they're becoming teenagers. But actually it's not really in those spectacular moments. It's whether or not you've made room and you've stopped talking or stopped engaging your text messages room enough for them to ask a question and say, what about this? Why do I feel so sad about this? Or paying attention enough to know, hey, you seem really quiet right now. Want to go for a walk and talk about it? You see, you have to make room in your schedule for presence or it won't happen. And so those two things have really um, served us well in our home just to um, engage our kids and cause them to want to stay and to really press in and, and share with us a lot of things that are going on in their lives. Yeah. I feel like that's very convicting. I So in general, I have a boundary working full-time that I don't work after work hours. I've just decided sure. that just doesn't really work for me. But my middle guy, he's in fourth grade. He has this speech he has to give, and he has been asking me every day after school to help him. It's in like two weeks, but he's like, I want it to be really good. He's just a prepared type kid. Mm-hmm. But he's been asking me to help him. I'm like, as soon as I'm done with work, as soon as I'm done, mm-hmm. I work till five. And I haven't made the time for him. But I have decided, even before this interview, okay, when he comes home from school today, I'm going to do his PowerPoint and I can work tonight when they're all in bed. And I can Mm -hmm. like move that boundary to serve him and what he needs right now. It doesn't have to be every day, but like right now that's what he needs. Because I think he needs to feel seen and loved. And to know that (laughs) we as parents follow through on what we say we'll do. Right. Because the last thing we want is for our kids to feel like they ask and ask, but they can't trust us that will follow through on the very things that we promise. And so I'm pretty careful as a parent to um, under promise and over deliver. I try not to Mm -hmm. say things like, oh yeah, we're totally going to do that. Oh, I I try to say things like, hey, mama's working. You want to see what I'm working on right now? I can't give you my full attention. So don't start on that. Don't start on that story yet because I want to give you my full attention, but you won't be able to have that for a few hours. And so saying that specifically means that there's freedom in it. There's no shame Mm -hmm. in being really busy about other things that you have to take care of, even if it's getting on the phone with a friend, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think sometimes we try to multitask so much that we're like, well, sure, it's fine. You, you can tell me or you can work on that. I'll, I'll help you a little bit, but really we're focusing on something else. And I think that actually does more harm. And I don't want to use the word harm. I just mean that's so much less effective because then we're kind of like, repeating this idea in their minds that half of our attention is all they're ever going to get. And so I think it's probably wise for us to just prioritize well, count the cost, and um, treat our kids the way we treat other things that are important to us. Yeah. You can multitask a lot of things. You can't multitask your kids (laughs) as much as you You really can't. You can do it for a little bit, but it won't produce the results or cause you to feel settled in your parenting. Ever. Yeah, right. You guys, I want to tell you about a new movie coming out on October 4th called White Bird. I was just able to see it and it's really good and powerful. From the world of wonder, which sparked a movement to choose kind, comes the inspirational next chapter, White Bird. 
Julian is struggling to fit in at his new school after being expelled from his previous school for his treatment of Augie Pullman. And then Julian is visited by his grandmother, who's played by Helen Mirren, and is transformed by the compassionate and heroic story of her attempts to escape Nazi-occupied France during World War II. From the director of Finding Neverland, Whitebird delivers a moving message about the power of kindness, hope, and bravery. This coming-of-age story bridges generations of faiths, revealing how acts of extraordinary compassion can create lasting miracles. This movie is PG-13 because it's about World War II. There are some heavy themes in here and some tough scenes, so be discerning about whether to bring your younger kids, maybe consider a date night, or bring your older kids and have some really amazing conversations afterwards. Be brave, choose kind, don't miss Whitebird, exclusively in theaters beginning October 4th. So mine are younger. I have seventh through third grade. But I am convinced that one of the hardest but also probably most beautiful parts of parenting is launching your kids. And you're a mom of six, and you talk about earlier, you talked about how it you have to hold them tight and then let them go. So what have you learned by watching your older boys launch into adulthood? Like, what is it that you really want them to take away when they leave your house? Yeah, you know, I heard it said once that success could be measured by whether the next generation wants to repeat what they've been given. And um, I think it's interesting because as my boys have left home, um, what they prioritize really speaks to what they value and treasure most. And so we don't determine that for them. We're not saying, hey, um, I'll be checking in on you to see if you're organizing your day the way we did at home or whether Sunday morning looks a certain way, whether you go to a church that we pick for you. It's not quite like that. However, we do say, hey, son, tell me about the church you're going to. And I got to tell you, it was pretty darling for me to find out that my 22-year-old went to a new members class, you know, checked in on and understood the doctrinal position of the church, uh, became a member, did a background check so he could serve in children's church and help with younger children. Like we didn't ask him to do any of those things, but he had been given this understanding that the local church is really important, that being involved in the body of Christ is really important, that we're not a consumer in church and that your personal relationship with Jesus really matters. And so um, I think what I'm learning as I launch these young adults is learning to ask good questions um, without interpreting everything or trying to control it all. Um, I think sometimes as mamas, especially sometimes our um, desire for our kids' best sometimes comes out in the form of worry or nagging or nitpicking or yeah. trying to control things because totally. we just th- we think that if we can just like get our death grip on things, we'll make sure that everything t- turns out the way we think they should. And I kind of want to be like, well, Ruth, how well has that worked out for you in your own life? Well, not that great. So (laughs) let's not do that with their life either. And so um, it's been a blessing to really see how much God loves them more than I do, just like you said, and that um, I can let them fly and I can let them fall a little. Um, So far, we've not really seen any huge departures, but that doesn't mean that that won't happen. But Troy and I can trust that in the same way that we lay a strong foundation and ultimately they have to experience and walk with the Lord themselves. And so it's kind of, that's the part where I'm like, okay, you're going to leave the nest. Doesn't mean we're not going to speak into your life. It doesn't mean we won't get on phone calls and talk about it. We're here for resourcing, uh, reactions, um, you know, good advising, all those things. We will do all that. But ultimately, it has to be them learning and growing and coming to us for what they need. Yeah. I like to ask good questions. Cause sometimes I'm big into open-ended questions, but sometimes even with that, I feel like I ask them a little bit in a leading way. Like kind of want to hear what I want to hear, but I'm learning. We're all learning. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Do you think that you, do you want to do anything differently? So you have three that are gone, three that mm-hmm. are home. Do you want to do anything differently with the three that are home still? You know, um, I'm feeling pretty, fairly pretty um, grounded in our trajectory. Like it took us a little while to figure out like, yeah. hmm, how do we want to talk about these things? 
um, I don't know that we would do anything differently. The only thing I am noticing in myself is probably that for anyone who's watching, listening, if you have multiple kids, if the range is wide, you do grow a little tired by number five or six. (laughs) And so I do notice in myself sometimes assuming in that more is caught than taught thing that the older brothers have already like brought the younger ones along because they really have like Mm -hmm. culture, expectations, the way we speak to one another. A lot of that is just woven into the way we are as a family. But um, I'm pretty, I'm feeling convicted here as we go into this 2.0 version of our family that um, I can't, I can't take my foot off the, the, the pedal. Like I can't just be like, coast, see what happens, you know, that I actually have to apply just as much energy in discipling number five and six as I did with number one and two. And so in that sense, it's almost like the other side of what you're asking. It's not that I would change something. It's that I would press into and make sure that I don't get lax about the very things that have mattered so much in our parenting in the first decade. Yeah. And I feel like that's true for any amount of kids that you have. Like I have yeah. three, but I feel like it's so common with that last to yes. let go of the brake or the gas a little bit. You're totally yeah. right. Yeah. And speaking of that, not letting go of the brake or the gas, but how have you seen your sibling interactions change, especially as like the older ones have left the house? Like how have they continued to pour into their younger siblings and develop oh, I, relationships like that? I love that question. Um, early on when they were – all in the home and um, they're 11 years apart. So they're about every two years that they were, yeah. you know, about two years apart. Um, they all had their friends. Everybody has friends. Everybody has groups. Some of them have overlapping friends, but we always said in the home, your brothers are always going to be your very best friends. Even mm-hmm. when there were fights in the home <laughs> or even when they didn't like the way somebody else did something, you know, there's always been conflict. It's not like everybody's just you know, warm and rosy all the time. No, there's conflicts. There's, I got my feelings hurt. Of course, we have all those things in home, in our home. But um, we said that so often and so much, and they experienced so much time together versus we we didn't have our kids spending all their time with their friends all the time. So it wasn't that on any given Friday night, six boys were at sleepovers at six different people's houses. That actually never happened. So occasionally, maybe there were friend things that were going on in groups even. But for the most part, most significant interactions on weekends or um, in our evenings were as an entire family. And I think that built up such a core and strong sense of family bond and friendship between the boys that um, I really think of them as a band of brothers, you know, and that they grieved as their brothers left and they are counting down to the, the days till they're all together. Recently, we moved our last one, our last college student, yeah. our current last, our newest yeah. college <laughs> students, I should say. We moved him in to school and even his oldest brother flew in from Wisconsin and we were all together. It was a long weekend. So we were all together. And I mean, spoken like a real mama here, but I was like, these are the best days of my life. Like this is the best. I mean, we were doing nothing, but shopping at Ikea and getting lunch and then moving stuff and then running errands. But it was incredible because all six of them were together and the dynamic was still there. And so when they're not together, there's a lot of FaceTiming, there's a lot of phone calls, and sometimes there's a lot of intentionality that has to go into, let's say, the older one finding out what's happening with the younger one because it used to be that they had dinner together so they'd hear about it. But now it has to be a more intentional conversation of, tell me what's going on. Tell me what seventh grade life is like when he's a 22 year old. And so, um, so that's happening. And now there's more individual fostering because since it's not everybody sitting at a table together, individual one on one relationships are forming in a deeper way now that they're in different parts of the country. Yeah. And how amazing to all be together, moving your son in and just see the fruits of everything you had poured into those sibling relationships. It like was really can sweet. Still be close, even when they all live in different places and are in different yeah. seasons of life. That's, I think, that's everybody's goal for their adult it kids. Was really, it was really, it was really sweet. I was, I was in heaven. I'm really, that was the best weekend ever. 
I imagine. I'm just really happy for you hearing that story. Like I'm just imagining it to be a true joy. So I think that's amazing. So kind of final question to wrap us up. What have you learned about Jesus as you've walked alongside your boys learning about Jesus? Hmm. Well, I think the thing that keeps bubbling up over and over again, um, if you've read any of my work, you know that I'm a recovering striver, as in I seek perfection. I seek getting it right the first time and then never having to learn it again. I struggle with wanting to earn my worth and be like, look, Jesus, look how I did this great thing. Don't you love me so much now? Aren't I so worthy of you? I think the way I used to say it was that I was trying so hard to be so amazing that I almost didn't need grace. Like, I don't even need grace because mm-hmm. I took care of it. Like, I, I I nailed it. I'm good. And at the core, it's a desire to be seen, known, loved, to belong, to feel a genuine sense of identity and worth. And I think our kids are always looking for the same thing, even if they can't articulate it. And so the thing I learned, I've learned as a mama over and over, and maybe the most impacting thing in my own life is to recognize that um, weakness as a mom and as a child of God is a good place to be, not being perfect, not having it all together, not knowing the right answer to the hard question, not even being sure that I know exactly how to parent that difficult child going through a difficult season. That weakness actually puts me in the very place I need to be to receive strength from the Lord, wisdom from the Lord, to put me in a place of humility where I cry out to the Lord, because nothing causes you to pray more Mm -hmm. than when you feel desperate and you don't know what to do. And so it helps me recognize that my kids need the same kind of grace. They need that same kind of runway to learn these things. They're not going to get it right the first time, that just because I have to teach them again for the 20th time this week that they need to change their tone and their attitude. And speaking that way isn't edifying to another person. And you're not encouraging. I might be frustrated, but why should I be when the Lord's been patient with me and that I don't get it right again and again in my own life? So um, years ago, I started writing with a hashtag, motherhood is sanctifying. And what I meant by that when I started that hashtag so many years ago was that I'm being transformed, made more like Christ, made more holy as I'm growing as a mama. And so my job really isn't to change them. It's to be changed by the Lord so that that Lord could show me that I'm a child of God just as my children are a child of God as well and that they need to be transformed by the only one who can. I can just be a conduit of that. So I think it's probably more than anything learning that um, Jesus is patient. He is merciful. He has endless grace. And He waits for us. He waits for us to come to Him in humility. And um, and I can, I can apply a little bit of that in my parenting as well. Yeah. He is the good Father and the good shepherd, you know. Amen. Tell us how we can get a copy of your book and all of your other books and just connect with you if people aren't already connected with you. Yeah, I'd love to connect. Um, on social media and my website are both under my name, Ruth Joe Simons. That's R U T H C H O U S I M O N S. You can learn all my, about my books there uh, or find them wherever you find books. Um, On Instagram and on social media, I really seek to encourage in little tidbits and behind the scenes in life, but also in the messages that are on my heart through words, through art, and through um, the brand I created called gracelace.com, who have their own social media account and stuff. But if you're into watercolor art and beautiful truths for your life, check that out as well. Yeah, I'll link all that stuff in show notes so people can easily find it. Thank you so much for being on again. I just always love chatting with you and everything you have to share. I feel so encouraged, so thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for joining me today. I loved Ruth's reminder that we need to be reliant on God in every season, and we should model that to our kids too. You better believe that I'll be working on the PowerPoint today after school today too. If you loved this episode, please share it with a friend to encourage them in their parenting journey and in their faith. And please also don't forget to leave a review. May God bless you this week. May you remember that He is the Good Shepherd. He will guide you, care for you, and lead you to good pastures. Your home is with Him, and you can always feel safe there despite any circumstances around you. 
Thank you so much for listening to the Christian Parenting Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you love this podcast, would you please consider leaving a review and sharing it with a friend? This is the best way to reach more people and encourage even more parents. Christian Parenting is a donor-funded ministry, and we rely on friends like you to keep podcasts like this going. So to find out more about Christian Parenting and to make a donation, head over to christianparenting.org or at christianparenting underscore org on Instagram. Thank you again. See you next week. While farmers work hard to grow the best crop, their Iowa Corn Checkoff investments are working to foster industry connections to help companies replace petroleum with corn. Additional research is finding even more uses for corn and discovering new ways and practices to help farmers get the most out of their crop. The Iowa Corn Checkoff, working hard for Iowa's corn farmers. Go to iowacorn.org to learn more.